Good evening, everybody. Welcome to UQ's Briz Science Lecture Series. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. We are a free series of public science lectures held once a month here in wonderful Brisbane, but now also live streamed across the whole world. So really excited you could join us tonight. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore, and the series is hosted by the University of Queensland. Been running for over a decade now, so it's a great series to be part of. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. I also want to acknowledge those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture leaves a lasting legacy for all of us, uh, particularly future elders and leaders. Now, of course, as I said, tonight's talk is held virtually, so we have a few features to use. There is a chat function if you need to say anything to, uh, to me or to the uh, panel, any sort of technical issues. But if you have questions, you can use the Q and A function. Put your questions in there. And at the end of the talk, we will go through as many questions as we have time for. And hopefully that's all of them. Otherwise, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for follow up discussions online, Twitter, who knows. All right. So tonight, we, uh, Bruce Science has been on a little bit of a disease theme recently. I can't possibly imagine why. But uh, tonight is no exception. I'm very excited to introduce Professor Jimmy Botella, who is a professor of plant biotechnology at the University of Queensland. And in addition to being a leading researcher in genomics and crop improvement, he's also founded two companies and has 11 plant biotech patents. He also normally travels the world, at least until recent events, uh, with many different projects, which he's going to talk about tonight, amongst other things. And topic tonight is testing for diseases and how perhaps a high tech coffee mug might be the key to rapid disease diagnosis all around the world. So to tell us more, please put your virtual hands together for Professor Jimmy Botella. I thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And um, thank you for giving me the chance to uh, talk a little bit about um, our projects and uh, the projects in my life. Uh, we're very excited. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, okay uh, fantastic well uh, thank you again uh, I, I need to recognize uh, Dr. Michael Mason uh, what is a co-inventor in many of the technologies that, um, that I'm going to talk about uh, he's, he's a member of, of my research team um, a very valuable member is he's, he's a bloody genius um, so uh, his name has to be prominent in this in this talk all right, so what am I talking about? Um, some time ago, um, I'm talking about eight or nine years ago, um, we had the aim, we work a lot on, on eight programs in Southeast Asia. And um, one of the things that we came across is um, many times farmers see their crops uh, go bad and die. And, and the thing is, they don't know what to spray with. They don't know what kind of disease they have. So we started to thinking about creating, you know, disease diagnostics for resource poor environments that essentially is all about developing simple systems, diagnostic systems that you can do in the field with minimal equipment. Now, let me, uh, um, let me explain to you what I mean by resource poor environments, all right? Um, you can see here a um, couple of places where we work. This is uh, me in a market in Cambodia, in, um, right in, in regional Cambodia. And this is me following some people with a machete, uh, trying to make my way to some possibly disease trees uh, in PNG. So these are resource poor environments, but it's not the only kind of resource poor environments. Resource poor means that uh, not only that is in, in, a, in a developing country, but it could be in a place where you are kind of isolated. Let me explain this. The Netherlands have 42,000 square kilometers and 70 million people living there. Now, this winter holidays, I took a, um, a, a caravan with me and my family and we went to Western Queensland and we went to places like this one, Windora. Okay, well, Windora, um, it got an area of 60, if you look down here, 62,000 square kilometers. It's 33 
presence bigger than the Netherlands, and the entire population is 340 people, not million, 340 people. So you got something that is a lot bigger than the Netherlands, and instead of 17 million, you got 30, 340 people living there. And even if you want to get out of Windora, as we did, going even west, you got that the next fuel station is almost 400 kilometers away. That is a resource poor environment, meaning if you want to test something in a farm there, you are in a place where you don't have access to a lab and the next lab is very far away. So what the first thing that we started thinking about um, in, in our work is what exactly do we need in resource poor environments? The first thing that we need is something that is simple. We cannot do complicated things when we are in Cambodia or we are in Windora. Um, we need to avoid the need for highly specialized personnel, um, meaning whether you are in Windora or you are in, in Myanmar, uh, you're not gonna get the kind of technicians that we get in Australia. Um, you need to be able to do this either in the field, but it's as good as the car, if you can sit in your car or in a hotel room. Um, and we found out that, you know, wherever you go, there will be a little hotel or a place where you can sleep next, you know, close to your field, so that should be okay. You will need to do it with, without sophisticated equipment. You need to have easy storage and easy distribution. What do I mean by that is many of the stuff that we do in PNG, there is no way we can take it over there refrigerated. So we need to be able to do it at room temperature. So there's no point in developing anything that we cannot deploy in the country or we cannot take to Indora. So um, it is generally um, a consensus that the, uh, the molecular diagnostics are the more accurate and are the more sensitive that you can do. The problem with it is that it's very easy you know, to do it in these kind of situations. This is my lab. I took these pictures today with my phone. Um, um, you got everything you need in here. You got PCR machines, um, you got all kind of micro pipettes, you know, sterile chambers everything you need, that's okay. But that is not something that we can do in the field. And that's not something that we can do in the field, whether it is in Australia or overseas. So uh, for those of you who are not initiated in this uh, field of diagnostics, if you're gonna use nucleic acid-based diagnostics, you need to do three main steps. The first one is what is called sample preparation. That actually means you need to get your sample, call it from an animal or a plant or a human, and then you need to purify the nucleic acids because that's what you're going to use for your diagnostics. The second one is the reaction that is most of the time an amplification, call it PCR, isothermal amplification, any kind of amplification because we're trying to detect whether our sample have any DNA from a pathogen. And finally, when you finish your reaction, you need to look at it. I mean, you need to know whether, I mean, is it, is it positive? Is it negative? So you need to do that. Now in the lab, it's very easy. When you're in the field, it's not that easy because when you're in the field, you cannot do an electrophoresis and you don't have UV you know, uh, uh, light sources. But the truth is that um, when we started thinking about it, we really hit our, our heads against the wall because there is a very wise person who said once, there is nothing more difficult than making things simple. And for the first year or two, we really struggled. We came up with a lot of things, but every time we were trying to put it in the field, we found out that it wasn't that simple to do in the field. Until we came up with the first part of our solutions. The first part is sample preparation. You need to purify DNA or RNA, you need to purify nucleic acids. You can buy kits that will need, the minimum you will need, you will need, you know, micro pipettes. you might need a centrifuge, you might need, you know, a half an hour to purify that. We came up with this. This is what we call the DNA dipstick that contains a handle and this water repellent and then a little bit at the bottom that will bind nucleic acids uh, when you put that into your sample. So how do you do that? 
you have your, um, let's say you put your tissue here, a couple of uh, ball bearings, uh, so you can shake it. And when you shake it, you break up the tissue, all right? Then you insert the deep stick into it. You wash it once in a second liquid. And finally, you put it into your amplification. Now that can be done in 30 seconds. Every time I say that, people say, yeah, come on, give me 30 seconds, give me a break. Uh, here, here's the proof. This is um, GP, one of our PhD students who just finished and um, went back to China. Uh, and this is what uh, you can look at the entire process from, you, in this case, it's a plant. So you have a little bit of a leaf there and we have some liquid and a couple of uh, um, ball bearings. You will shake it for around, you know, eight, 10 seconds. And then you get our deep stick and you will see she, this dipping the deep stick into the sample, putting it into the wash buffer and then loading it into the tube. That's it. You close the tube and you can see that um, I wasn't exaggerating. Here it is, 30 seconds. That's all it takes to run. This looks very simple. This took us almost two years to come up with it. All right, does it work? Yes, it does. Um, these are uh, plant samples. You have all kinds of plants, rice, sugar cane, sorghum, soybean, barley, wheat. Then a friend of mine told me, ah, that's nothing. You need to try uh, trees. Trees are really tough. Well, here it is, mandarin, limes, lemon, passion fruits. These trees were selected because we could find some friends who had those trees in their backyards. Uh, we went through and actually didn't stop at plants. Um, you can see here, human blood. Um, you can see here is the samples when you purify it with our deep stick. This is with no purification. Human blood have a lot of impurities that will stop the reaction. But uh, without deep sticks, it works perfectly. These are melanoma cell lines. This is without purifying, and this is purifying. Aside from that, you can find pathogens in plants. These plants are, are infected with a bacterial disease, uh, Pseudomonas syringi, uh, and you can see here different severities, and you can see that you can identify them using our, our deep sticks. You can also go into pig land swaps. Um, this is cellulose purified, perfect. It works, uh, meaning you can do your sampling without deep sticks. And not only that, but you can use it for RNA viruses. This is a plant RNA virus, but at the end of the day, they are all the same. Uh, um, so what you can see here, uh, two different amplification technologies, PCR and LAMP. Um, in both of them, you can uh, detect the pathogen. That's good. So that's number one. We published this, and um, uh, it was published in Plus, Bi uh, Plus Biology, and I, I want you to have a look at the amount of views that this paper has had. This is almost 128,000 views. Um, we're talking about a scientific paper. We're not talking about you know, a Harry Potter book, all right? We're talking about a scientific paper. I didn't know there were so many scientists in the world, but obviously there are at least 128,000 scientists and every one of them look at it. We published this in November, as you can see, uh, at the end of November, almost December, 2017. And within one month, it, this is us, it made it to the biggest hits of the year. It was an automatic success. Everybody started using it. You will not believe how many people is using this kind of technology. Because um, when you look at the cost, uh, you'll be surprised. It costs less than 0 0.1 cent per sample. All right, so that's number one. What about two and three, amplification and visualization? Well, I'm gonna show you a bit of a history. How did we start? Um, you can do that if you are in the lab with this kind of equipment, again, my lab, you know, my people, not a problem as long as you have PCR machines, UV uh, visualization, electrophoresis equipment, it's all good. But when you're in the field, that's a different story. All right, you cannot take this stuff to the field. Because when we go, this is the kind of technology we get. We get a little bit of ice that is cut. I've never seen that in my life. This is in Cambodia. And you can see a saw, you cut a bit of ice, you put it in here, and then you head to the fields and you start doing assays. What is the version one? We started doing this. This was our first approach. 
And I want you to see it because it's, it's worth seeing it. By the way, we got the, the cover of our chemical communications with this. Um, essentially, um, would you, you have a, a bunch of equipment. It's not perfect, but it's better than what normally other people do. Um, you heat up water, either in the tea kettle or on, on a fire. We've done it on a fire. And you mix it up in a, in a bucket until you get your temperature. And then when you get the temperature, by the way, we're not using PCI, we're using isothermal amplification. It's a different kind of amplification that works pretty well, actually. Um, we have found a way to lyophilize our reactions. So all you need to do is to rehydrate them before, before you go to the field. So you take them to the field already rehydrated, and then you add your samples. This is how you do it. You add your samples to the tubes. Then you close the tubes and just float them in your bucket, wherever you have uh, uh, your water that is being heated to around 65 degrees. We noticed that if you put around three liters of water, it would, it would last for the time that the reaction takes place. The reaction normally is around 50 minutes. And how do you get to visualize that? That's the biggest step that we made. We created um, nano material particle solution that will go to the bottom on those reactions that are positive and would stay in solution on those reactions that are negative. So this is uh, what we call the developing, uh, developing agent, reagent. You can put it on them and all you need to do is to you took a little, little bit with your finger and just have a look at this because it happens very fast. Look at the tubes, look at the tubes, how some of those tubes are falling to the bottom while others stay black. 10 seconds. So you need to visualize a positive or a negative reaction. Positive reactions will go to the bottom, very easy to see, negative will stay in solution. Okay. So that was, we were really happy with that. You know, we tried and then again, you need to use micro pipettes for this. So it's good, but it's not ideal. Um, didn't give up and essentially thought, okay, let's rethink the whole thing again. Is there any way we don't use the micro pipettes with the tips, et cetera, et cetera? Because the first part, the sampling is already figured out with the deep sticks. The deep sticks, you don't need to use any pipettes, but it's quite okay. So we went back and said, all right, can we actually create a really portable instrument? So what we did is we found this, somebody came to us and said, Mike, there are these, you know, coffee mugs that you can buy on the internet, you know, um, from China, $16.60, free postage. You plug it into your car, and it will heat up your, um, your coffee. Of course, we want it to reach a 65 degrees. So how do we do that? Well, you can actually modify these things, putting a little bit of an integrated circuit. So it cuts the current when it feels that it's 65. And then when it goes below 63, it lets the current go again. So the, the mag is continually hitting and stop hitting, hitting, stop hitting. What else do we need in there? What would you need if you have a, a real-time PCR machine? Well, you need some LEDs. You need some photosensitive sensors that you can buy LEDs for one dollars each, uh, free postage. <laughs> uh, photosensitive, two dollars sixty, free postage. One of these Arduino uh, uh, um, uh, boards that you can actually you know, use and buy them even in Australia. You don't even need to go to China for that. And then you make a humongous expenditure because you need to put it all together by a 3D printer that you buy pretty much in, uh, we bought this one in Aldi. It was, I think it was $200 to put everything together. And what do you get with that? You get our coffee mug. And you might have been, you know, wondering, you know, this guy is telling us about a coffee mug. Well, that's a coffee mug. That is what we call our diagnostic droid. How does it work? Let me show you how it works. Um, we did all this, we got all these um, uh, 
stuff you know from the internet we assemble everything with 3d this this machine cannot communicate that's okay because actually it communicates with your phone with an app that we have created using bluetooth so you control the machine with your phone and then you know you just get the connection immediately it's automatic it's bluetooth um, you choose which detection method you want to use and once you do that the machine starts working and you can see here that it's reading the temperature it's continuously communicating uh, once it reaches the proper temperature it's going to tell you i'm ready to start so you put your tubes in the machine and you press the start all right the machine start working this is the insides of the machine so you can see it and what's inside the best part of this is we do have a microchip we have mathematical algorithms that will interpret the results for you we don't want people to interpret the results we want to give them a full final result now what, what at the beginning we had a mathematical algorithm we still have it but now we're using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning so what we actually do we do like a million reaction and the machine will look at them and we'll tell them these are negatives these are positives because at the end of the day every amplification is a little bit different than the, the other one so, but with with a bit of artificial intelligence and machine learning now the machine pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time give us the right interpretation this is positive or this is negative and that is very important because we want to do this in places where there are no really highly qualified technicians okay so um, um, I've been told that I have half an hour and I think I'm doing pretty well on time. Uh, the question is, all that is very good, Jimmy, but the truth is, does it work or not? I mean, have you taken it to the, to the field? Yes, we have actually, we have taken it to the field so many times. We have made so many improvements. There are so many stupid things that you never think when you're in the lab, but when you are out there, you come up with, wow, never thought of that. Well. First place, we started working, you know, um, in PNG, there is this um, coconut uh, disease. It's really bad disease. Um, you can have a, a, a 30 years old coconut tree. And when you get the disease, um, this one just got the disease. In four months, it's gonna look like this one, a telegraph pole. It's gonna kill a tree, a 30 years old tree. It can kill it in uh, three to four months. And this is a field that's been devastated by the disease. The only, and there's no solution for this disease. The only thing is you need to detect it early and then just burn the trees before it, it gets transmitted to other trees. It's the, this disease started in the Caribbean. Um, the main problem was, you know, how can we have some early detection in places where there is not that much technology? Well, um, this is it. You've seen this picture before. This is us getting into the jungle with a machete trying to find out, you know, a tree that is suspicious of being uh, deceased. Then we use the same machete to cut a little bit of the tree. Um, we use a, um, a drill to get some sawdust. All right, this is the kind of uh, sample that we start with. Now that sawdust is what we use to put it in a tube and mix it with the, with the water. By the way, you can actually have a really good job on this. Um, you can just mix it or you can put some music on it and it's a lot better. Just listen to this. So uh, it's not only a scientific endeavor, uh, it's a musical endeavor. You can actually do a lot of songs. Um, we had a lot of fun doing this kind of stuff. And then this is my lab. My lab is the back of a youth. And uh, this is quite sophisticated because I actually have some um, alfoil put in there just to do my reactions. As you can see, we already mixed the sample and then I get my little deep sticks go from one tube to the next to the reaction. And when I finish that, I put that in my machine. And our machine is here. You can see it here. Why did we get a coffee mug? A number of very practical reasons. First of all, 
when you are doing this kind of stuff, normally you have to go from one location to a very different one. And there is nothing better than plugging into the car and then driving for three hours to the next location. By the way, by the time you get to the next location, you already got the results from this location. So this is, this is the way it works. You just put it in there, plug it into the car, and there you go. Uh, example of you know, things that we needed to uh, improve in here. The first time that we tried that, I didn't realize that when you put the ignition key into the car and you start up the car, there is like a microsecond where you don't have current. And that would actually abort the reaction. It would just stuff up everything. Um, we only realized that when we did it the first time, and um, then we had to have the car running for 50 minutes because we could not stop it. Now we have put a little capacitor in there so it can survive for more than a minute, you know, without a current. All those kind of little details will just be so important every time you try to simplify things. This is a, a different project. This is was done in Cambodia. Um, this is Mike and this is me. Um, we were going to really uh, remote places. This is a village uh, where we got some uh, vendors, vegetable vendors in the village to get uh, collection. This is us in a farm, uh, just getting some leaves to check. What did we want to do? Um, you know that in many Asian countries, they tell you, whatever you do, never eat salad. Let me confirm this. Whatever you do, never eat salad. All right, so we went to all these markets. Yeah, we took samples, then and went back and this, did the analysis, you know, with our methodology, all right? And we're looking for E. coli contamination. Uh, what did we find? Well, we did 100 samples. Um, we found that 33% of all samples were contaminated. So it is true. Uh, when they tell you, uh, unless you are in a good hotel, don't try the salad. I would say, please don't do it. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, one of us actually got sick on, on that trip and uh, it was contaminated you know, salad that did it for us. But it's something even more important. It's not about having 33%. Look at this. We actually did some collections in the countryside and some collections in the city. And of course, we labeled everything. And what happened? Well, it happened that in the countryside, we have around 50% contamination. Half of everything we got was contaminated with E. coli. While in the city, we only got 6% contamination. You know the difference between one and the other? The city markets actually have running water and they kind of spray the water on the vegetables and that is good enough to wash up the E. coli contamination that, that they have in the rural markets. So there are so many good lessons that you can actually get from these things. Um, um, the final one, we got more, uh, but you, I'm just gonna tell you another one that we're doing. Uh, and we're working on this as we speak. Um, sugarcane, important for Queensland. And you talk about remote locations and the resource poor location. This is in North Queensland, and this is a very remote resource poor location. Sugarcane have a, um, a disease called retum stunting disease. Um, Sugar Research Australia uh, has given us uh, funds to look into this. Why? Uh, it's an important disease for sugarcane. Sugarcane is important for Queensland. Um, you can actually detect, you know, this disease is caused by a bacteria. Um, um, you can detect the bacteria if you look into the sugarcane. Now, look at this picture. You can see all the sugar cane there? Good. So which one do you test? You can test that one. What about this one? Would you test this one? Or perhaps that one? Or what about that other one? Okay, let me tell you, the industry tests thousands and thousands and thousands of individual sugar cane stalks to try to detect the disease because it's an important one. But the truth is, it doesn't matter how many thousands you test, this, this is just a single farm, this is a single field. What kind of representation do you have here? It's minimal. Is there a solution? Well, there could be. If we, are, if we are correct, there could be a solution. 
And the solution would be all these fields get collected and every farm goes individually to a sugar mill. Now, would it be possible for us, once the sugar cane is extracted the juice, if we test for the pathogen in the juice, we will know whether that farm had the disease or not, instead of doing 10,000 individual sugarcane you know, stalks from here, we can look at the juice. Now, of course, a, a, a meal has a very a, a kind of non-sophisticated laboratory facility. So it's, it's a resource poor environment. And what we're trying to do is being able to detect it at the mill. What would actually save the sugarcane industry thousands and thousands and thousands of assays, each one of them costs a lot of money, and it will give you a much better representative picture of what is happening there. Now, so what can we do now? The truth is that we can detect diseases in plants, in animals, in humans, in food. We can do it virtually anywhere. Let me explain this. We are not inventing any technology new for disease detection. What we're doing is making it possible that non-technical personnel can do it and they can do it pretty much anywhere. And um, of course, you know, we can quickly develop and deploy tests for any new diseases, pretty much anywhere. Now, what do our job do? Um, we have some perks. The you know, first thing is that you get to see things like, you know, this floating uh, uh, village in Cambodia that, you know, receives around zero tourists in a year, uh, because in the places that we work, believe me, they are really remote places. So you get to see all those things, well, it's fantastic, but you have some inconvenience too, because you need to relocate your, um, your office. For example, this is my office with my laptop when I'm working in PNG. I know it's, it's really annoying having to work in these conditions. I um, actually took out the beer bottle from here because I thought it would not be professional, but that's the kind of uh, stuff that you do. And when you finish, you just go to the swimming pool, get a margarita, look at really exotic places, and best part of all, you get to enjoy the local cuisine. For example, the famous luxury hamburger that's in Cambodia, that of course, you can always get it with French fried. So if you ever wanna see how to fry a French, just go to Cambodia. It used to be a French colony, so I guess that's why they wanna you know, fry them. Um, that essentially is the end of my talk, and I'll be really happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was a fantastic presentation, and um, I'm certainly feeling like all of the lab gear that we spend uh, money on at the moment, you know, we need to really start economizing a little bit given what you can do with uh, a coffee mug. Um, we will, of course, take questions now for Jimmy. So if you've got a question, pop it into the Q&A section. Meanwhile, just a reminder that if you would like to be notified of future Briz Science Talks, you can head to our website, sign up to our mailing list, follow us on Twitter or Facebook or more. Plenty of opportunities there. We will be back for one more talk this year in December, and we're going to a, a different format for next month, which is going to be on the 7th. And we're going to be having speakers from the three minute thesis competition, the finalists from that competition, who are going to run through their three minute talks for us. So it'll be a smorgasbord of new science. So I definitely encourage you to get along to that. All right. Um, Jimmy, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. Okay. First question is from Fiona, who asks, have you done any work on a COVID-19 test? I knew that would be the first question ever. Um, uh, no, I have not. Uh, we try to connect with the government sources. We try to do our best. Uh, we didn't have any luck with that. Uh, one thing I can tell you, um, the answer to this is, does my method work for COVID? Yes, it does. Uh, because 
funny enough, um, we have already seen a preprint of a publication that is using our method to detect COVID. It's a pity that, you know, somebody else had to do it, but um, that's the way it is. Well, we all know, we all know the truth. Um, great. Okay, next question um, from Tom, who asks, what does each coffee mug cost to make? So I assume it's after uh, all is said okay. and done with your modifications and... All right, if you buy everything from Hong Kong free delivery, uh, it would be... Uh, um, Okay, let me explain this. The next thing that you can buy, uh, call a, a portable real-time uh, uh, isothermal machine, costs around $15,000, it's portable. Um, but let me explain this. A piano is portable. It's just difficult to move, all right? But you, know, you can move a piano. And this one, you, could, you, know, you can bring it with you, uh, with a donkey, I guess, you know, because it, you know, it's around 15, 20 kilos. Um, and, and it costs around thirteen to 15000 We can make this, uh, the components would cost around $100. Assembling them is a different thing, all right? Still pretty incredible. Fantastic. Um, I've got a question from Scott who asks, has this technology been patented or is it freely available? Uh, noting its benefit to resource poor areas. Okay, um, uh, let me explain this. Um, it, it was patented uh, by the, uh, uh, the University of Queensland uh, was very magnanimous about anything that had to do for non-profit, you know, uh, uh, developing countries would be provided free of charge, free of IP. Uh, now at this time, I must say, that the technology is now free for anyone who wants it. Wow. Well, there you go. There's a, a good summer project for anybody who uh, would like to uh, do their own testing. Um, I know we've had some talks on um, bio, uh, like, you know, backyard biohackers previously. We've talked about, you know, people who do this sort of thing in the backyard. So this seems right up that alley to me. Well, let me, let me explain one thing. You know, one of the main uses that this technology could have, high school. I mean, you could actually do now molecular work in high schools because the cost of these deep sticks, you know, we've been providing them free of charge to anyone who wants to, to use them, okay? But the cost, the actual cost is less than 0 0.01 cent, you know, per deep stick. And that actually would allow you to do molecular work in high school. Think about, you know, that would have been impossible, all right? But if you can purify your DNA for, you know, in 30 seconds, you could actually start running PCR, you know, PCR, I'm not gonna say how much does it, does it cost, but you know, the first part of it, the purification, it would be there for anyone. So where would uh, someone go if they wanted to learn about this? Uh, well, I mean, if you want to know how to make them, we just published that in Nature Protocols. We, uh, uh, the editor of Nature Protocols came to talk to us, mostly because of COVID, and say, you know, if someone wanted to produce your deep sticks. So uh, aside from the initial paper in PLOS Biology, there is a new one just published like a, a week ago in Nature Protocols, where we explain how to make them. You need things as sophisticated as paper and, and a spaghetti maker. I actually have both of those things, so I'm set. There you go. Oh, by the way, a photocopy paper doesn't work. It's got to be laboratory paper, like the normal Wattman paper. And there's one thing that works even better than that, and I'm afraid to say it in public, is, um, is, is the toilet paper. which was a limited resource for a while, but now it's probably back to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so fantastic. So if you're interested in trying this out yourself, um, get ready to check out that paper. And if anybody uh, does do this in a high school setting, you know, drop us a line at Bris Science because, you know, we'd love to hear about it. Oh, by the way, if any high school want to try it, we're more than happy to provide them with enough deep sticks. Brilliant. So you heard it right there. Uh, get in touch with Jimmy, a great opportunity. 
All right. Um, got a couple more questions here, if you're up for it, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So next question is, are there partnerships with produce and crop farmers in regional areas to supply these resources and technical know-how? Um, okay, we are ready to uh, call it commercialize this. Um, look, let's look at reality. Reality is I have a lab. Um, um, I, I can provide some to high schools and whatever. Of course, there is more than that. You need to have the, the kit, the reactions ready to run and whatever that, in my opinion, it would be a lot better to get a company to produce that because a lab would only last as long as I have some funds, you know, to get somebody employed to do those things. That, by the way, I don't have any. Um, we have funds for research, but we don't have funds to provide this kind of stuff. We'll be delighted to help people who want to put it out there for regional Queensland or regional Australia or regional PNG. All right. I mean, we don't mind. But the truth, as somebody told me, is that anything that is sustainable, it needs to make money. So it stays there. It, it, it continuously provides things and obviously makes some money for, for the people who make them. But it's, it's continuity. Otherwise, a lot of these things die in the lab whenever the head of the lab moves to something else. Right. Well, I, we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask you one final question. You've obviously refined and refined this process and looked for cost savings all along the way. Um, what if we went the other way? What if you got a uh, very large grant? Um, you know, everyone on Bristol Science chips in, you get a big grant. What would be uh, your next on your hit list? What would you want to do? Um, I would go to the Ferrari uh, shop and get myself a red Ferrari. Uh, it's something that I always wanted to have. And as a scientist, I don't think I would ever do. Um, no, look, um, what would I do? Um, I would set a, a center distribution for new and emerging diseases. The good thing about this is any new disease, think about quarantine in Australia. We have a, a new foreign disease that is coming and whatever. We can have things down and distributed. And of course, we would, I would say, you know, we need to put something there that we charge people. So they pay um, at least the cost of things, all right? And it will be this kind of um, distribution center where we can provide ready to use kits for people with uh, a video instruction on how to do it. My oh. hit would, I mean, my hit would be, uh, you know, um, human diseases. Um, and we have a partnership with somebody here in Queensland uh, in one of the uh, big uh, medical centers uh, for some diseases in uh, regional um, um, out there in the Philippines that are very difficult to diagnose. Um, so human is, is an important thing. We can actually provide a lot of that. But when, when I think about it, it goes, it's not only human. Uh, for a farmer, if your pig dies, well, you don't have any pigs, all right? You know, I mean, you, you cannot imagine when you go out there, the things that you confront, you know, you're confronted with. It's like, what are you talking about a pig? My, a pig is the future of my family. So that kind of stuff, you know, we could do quite a lot. And I need to acknowledge that um, ACR and the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research have been very generous with us. They gave us um, uh, what they call a, 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 sh um, and a small grant of around $100,000 that was essential in us thinking and developing all these things. So I need to uh, recognize, you know, the help from ACI is, is, is a fantastic agency. And I, I hope that, you know, they keep, you know, uh, producing more and more uh, uh, innovations to, to help farmers. Great. Well, that is a fantastic note to finish on, Jimmy. Um, Abdul Aziz, you asked where this webinar was recorded. And yes, this and all the Briz Science talks are available on YouTube. And this one will be up within the next week or so. So um, you can watch this again and get all the details. Um, Jimmy, thank you so much for your time this evening for both a really informative presentation, but also a very entertaining one. Uh, we really appreciate it and uh, can't wait to have you back in another year to hear what you've worked on next. Thank you very much. Have a great night all. Um, stay online for the survey after you hang up and uh, we'll see you all next month.